things like 9-11 or wars or pandemics or recessions. And that certainly has some influence on people, but not as much as technology and technological Mm. change. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Jean Twenge to the podcast. Jean is professor of psychology at San Diego State University. She frequently gives talks and seminars on generational differences in technology based on a data set of 39 million people. Her audiences have included college faculty and staff, parent groups, military personnel, camp directors, and corporate executives. Her work has been repeatedly featured by the media, and she has authored more than 180 scientific publications and books, including iGen, Generation Me, and the narcissism epidemic. Her latest book, which is her magnum opus, is called Generations. In this episode, I talked to Jean Twenge about the real differences between the generations. Did you know that our current time has the most number of living generations to coexist ever in the history of humanity? Unfortunately, there is often conflict and miscommunication between them. According to Jean, this is largely due to how the advancement of tech has shaped major life experiences. She shares interesting statistics about each cohort and debugs common misconceptions about baby boomers, millennials, Gen Z, and others. We also touch on the topics of narcissism, polarization, mental health, gender identity, and compassion. So without further ado, I bring you Jean Twenge. Nice to finally meet you. Yeah, I feel the same. It's been a while, but... It's uh, good timing because this is uh, your magnum opus. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Generations, the real differences between Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, boomers, and silence and what they mean for America's future. No big deal. No big deal. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I mean, talk about uh, a synthesis of data. (laughs) You know, we talk about like, you know, in grad school, it's like if I have more than 200 participants, I'm... I'm happy I get a PhD, <laughs> but you, um, your analysis is derived from 21 data sets that go back to the 1940s and up to as recent as this year, spanning about 38 million people. Is that right? Um, that's about right. Yeah. And I'm fortunate I did not have to collect that data myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is good. That is good. Your book covers um, these five generations, silence. Born 1925, 1945, boomers. Born 1946, 1964, Generation X, which we'll talk about because I don't even know where I belong, but that's born 1965, 1979. Millennials, born 1980 to 1994, and Gen Z, born 1995 to 2012. What is the main uh, criteria upon which those five were clustered? You mean in terms of determining, say, the the birth year cutoffs, that type of thing? Yeah. Who decided that? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, nobody and everybody. There's not really uh, any commission that decides, you know, what those cutoffs should be. You know, pretty much everybody agrees that living now is different from what it was like to live 100 years ago or 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. Um, And we agree that that has an effect on, you know, people's behaviors and attitudes and values. So really, you know, the debate is kind of around the details of then, you know, how do you group the generations? Um, Are those cutoffs the right ones? So for boomers, it was fairly clear based on demographics, based on the baby boom, so on fertility rates. And then from there, it's a little bit more fuzzy, but technology has accelerated some of the turnover and, and change. And so the generations have got a little bit shorter. And the cutoffs that I'm using are, you know, more or less agreed upon, um, although you can certainly debate them. Okay. Yeah, I've seen Gen X uh, sometimes defined, uh, sometimes I see like the missing year 1979, which is the year I was born, and some people don't know where mm-hmm. to put that. <laughs> yeah. I think most most of the theories and most of the, the, the cutoffs would put you as a Gen Xer. So you're okay. a late Gen Xer, right, in that transition between Gen X and Millennials. I'm an early Millennial. Uh, well, I, I haven't seen a whole <laughs> lot of people using 79 for early millennial. Um, it Usually the cutoffs are 1980 for the first year for millennials, or sometimes I see 1981, sometimes I see 1982. Mm. Okay. Well, you know, the traditional or classic uh, way of kind of talking about the thing that kind of is the main differentiator between all these things is looking at major life events that everyone experienced together. But you argue in your book that that's 
may be missing out on um, on some really key differences between these things. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Because, um, yeah, that's the traditional focus was on major events. You know, how old were you when certain big things happened in the world or in the country? So things like 9-11 or wars or pandemics or recessions. And that certainly has some influence on people, but not as much as technology and technological mm. change. And there, I'm not just talking about computers and smartphones, but also things like labor-saving devices like washing machines, air conditioning, airplanes, better medical care. You know, These are the things that make living now so completely different from what it was like to live in a previous era. You know, what was it like being a silent, <laughs> the silence generation during the, the Great Depression? Um, obviously, there was no TV, right? Uh, and no phones, <laughs> no, uh, very hard to communicate. I guess you write, you wrote letters to each other a lot, right? You know, yeah. kind of remnants from the 1800s, you know? Yeah. Um, you could talk on the phone, but you know, you had to pay the big bill if it was long distance. <laughs> Gen Xers are kind of the last generation to really remember that. Although uh, probably maybe some millennials too. Hmm. Well, what, let's talk about, let's start with the sound generation a little bit and talk about them. There's some interesting research suggesting they, may have been more mentally healthy than the generations before them and also after them is that true like out of even all the yeah. genera- like out of all the generations they might yeah. be more most and they had the least technology so uh you know uh, what's going on there yeah. is there a causation there <laughs> no maybe um you know i think there's the, the silent generation does show some some a little bit more of the influence of big events, probably because there were huge events when they were young, like the Great Depression and like World War II. And a lot fewer of them were drafted. Mm-hmm. So a lot of silence um, fought in Korea, but a lot fewer than, say, the greatest generation before them fighting in World War II. Mm. And then less than, than boomers being drafted to Vietnam. So they kind of had that sweet spot. They you know, we're really coming to adulthood during that post-war prosperity. Mm-hmm. And it seems to have kind of grounded them and maybe helped um, them develop, you know, a more positive outlook on life. How do you know what their mental health was? What, what's, the, what's the data you're looking at there that you could possibly compare to uh, this generation, for instance? Yeah, so um, you're always with these things of looking at generational differences and change over time. You're a little bit of a prisoner to the data that's out there. Um, sure. There, there is a big survey that has asked about um, how many days people have of poor mental health in a month. Um, it's kind of a crude measure, but it goes back to 1993. Uh, and then we can kind of control for age and look at each generation. And so that's one of the data sets I used for that conclusion or mm. silence. You control for age and then take a look. Their mental health is um, better than the greatest generation before them and the boomers after them. You said something really interesting there about controlling for age. I, I am an individual differences researcher. So my my natural question is, is the variation within each gener- generation greater than the variation between I mean, for mo- for most group differences, you're going to have more variation. Like sex differences, within. for instance. Yeah, right, so absolutely. Much, yeah. And yeah. the same is true for generations. Mm. You know, I'm just wondering how much of these effects are, are related to age. But I'm glad that you can you, you said you control for age. That's that. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, that kind of, that's kind of the obvious thing. Oh, yeah, you, ha- you yeah, have to. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, you yeah. got you to consider that. I know. That, I agree. You know? I agree. Well, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that. You know, th- I think another kind of, obvious maybe uh maybe obvious question a lot of people are thinking is is it normal for every generation to criticize or be confused by the generation that follows is that just like the pattern you find over and over again i think it is kind of human nature as things change around you you're trying to figure it out um so i think each generation as they get older then is trying to figure out how the world changed almost kind of underneath them and then also trying to understand the young generation I've always found it fascinating that older generations are really fascinated by younger ones. Younger ones, not so much about older generations. They're like, oh, you guys are done. And it's just, <laughs> they want to kind of skip over it or something. You know? You guys are done. 
<laughs> no, there is a kind of attitude. I mean, they're not going to actually say that, but that's kind of what the motivation seems to be sometimes. And I don't know. I I think it's always better if we're, we're, we're trying to all understand each other. That's usually the better outcome. I agree. But, you know, there's this like, there's just this like spirit in the air. It just doesn't feel loving. Uh, between the generations mm -hmm. uh, i don't like it. i don't like the way it makes me feel mm -hmm. you know like um okay boomer you know you right. know are you familiar with that insult yeah you know, or, and I'm, uh, I'm i'm completely with you i mean yeah. it, it's it's really really unfortunate and i think there's a lot of generational misunderstanding and conflict now i think some of it just comes from that we communicate in different ways and that technological change has kind of sped up those those differences and and led to some of those misunderstandings and you know to be fair it's not just across generations we have a lot of political polarization I, you know, we have a lot of negativity just overall okay i really i really want to understand this i agree there's a lot of political polarization i you know looking at all the differences between and there's a lot you i mean it's a it's a rich a rich book it is your magnum opus seriously congratulations what i find so fascinating is there's something really really different about this uh about what's the latest generation gen z is that mm -hmm. is that yeah there's something r like r like it, it's almost like at least at least the other four generations they're talking the same language <laughs> like yeah maybe mm -hmm. drugs the, but there's more drugs in one than the other but they, everyone knows what drugs are yeah but there's something you know in gen z it's like we can call it the transgender <laughs> generation you know just looking mm -hmm. at your stats i'm like why not call it the transgender generation or the gender fluid generation mm -hmm. because that is what it's just gener there's something very very different about generation z um i'm not making any judgment call about it but i'm just stating you know what what stood out to me when i was looking at uh, reading all the difference between all the generations and to what extent is is so much this political polarization being driven by by gen z i guess mm -hmm. that's my question yeah 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 um i mean i think i think politically the break is between gen x and millennials which is mm. kind of fascinating because in a lot of psychological ways around individualism, um, self-focus, things like that, those two generations are actually kind of similar in mm. how they grew up and some of their attitudes. But politically, that's where the break occurs. Whether we're talking about, you know, Democrats versus Republicans, conservative versus liberal, that type of politics, or just things in the culture in general around free speech, around, you know, how much we should um, be talking about things versus not about, you know, just all of these campus controversies and so on. That's where the break seems to take place. Well, that's interesting that you put it there because, you know, like Coddling the American Mind kind of book, they put it at really at this generation. They put it in the last like 10 years. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and it has it has definitely accelerated for sure. Mm. Okay, so it's accelerated. Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't disagree with, with that idea okay. that, you know, Gen Z has taken that next level. But I, okay. I, I think there's a lot of millennial participation in yeah. in some of those things. I think yes. with, on campus, it was Gen Z that really kind of um, brought those issues to the forefront. But in the last five years or so, when there's been conflicts ar around um, free speech or political things in the workplace, it's often been millennials and Gen Z banding together versus the Gen X and boomer managers or bosses. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about that later. I, I have that on my list to talk about. I really want to talk about narcissism <laughs> because, um, you know, this is, this is, uh, I, I've wanted every new book you have that comes out. You know, I was like, oh, I really want to have her on my podcast. So this is finally, I get you on my podcast and we get to like go back in the archives <laughs> of your work, which is great. And the narcissism research, I love how it's evolved. I've no, I've seen an evolution with you, you know, and, uh, and qualifications emerge. Mm -hmm. So I'm almost glad I waited. I am glad I waited till mm -hmm. now because, you know, this is, we get the most up to date information. My reading of the situation is that Generation X is kind of like the self esteem movement generation, not necessarily narcissism, but it's like like self esteem is the gateway drug to narcissism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this is just my at least my, when it's not based on anything real. Right. It is nothing yeah. real. It's like you're strong enough, you're good enough. You know, like those the uh, Saturday Night Live skit. Yep, Stuart uh, Smalley. Uh, yep, Stuart Smalley. And then. That I feel like was a gateway drug to the millennials, like just up to 2008, a sort mm -hmm. of a sort of full blown, not just like I'm good enough, doggone it, but I'm the best. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then that all fell apart. Yes. Yeah, so tell me what yeah. happened after. I know. And I think that's I've been following your work. So after 2008, it fell apart and then it started. It, it seems like it started to kind of like 
drastically go down in, in terms of uh, mental health, in terms of, it's almost like some bubble popped, um, mm -hmm. some a self illusion or something. Um, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, like, um, and then, and now I, you know, I, I, the way I see it is now we live in a very victimhood mentality based culture. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just my perception, but is that, but what are your thoughts on this? Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think the change in narcissism is one of the few examples of psychological traits where you really see the impact of the economic, the great recession of mm. a, you know, a recession. Um, a Good lot of point. other things don't really change all that much around the economic cycles, but narcissism really did. It peaked mm. right before the Great Recession and then started to go down. Mm. But then, you know, there's got to be something else going on because the U.S. economy then started to improve after 2011 or 2012, right? But narcissism kept going down. And, but that coincides with some of the other trends with the transition to, to Gen Z of the rise in depression the rise in unhappiness, the decline in self-esteem, you know, all of which would, at least for a young population, point in that same direction of, of narcissism also going down. I've wanted to bring something up with you for a long time. Um, I, I guess it's the common theme of our conversation today, <laughs> but oh, I'm glad I, I want to I wanna bring this up to see what your thoughts on this are, if you've looked, thought of this in this way. I've been um, differentiating in my research uh, quite a bit between grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. And what I'm seeing in my data is actually an increase in vulnerable narcissism. That makes sense. After 2008. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering how you, yeah, how that lands for you. Yeah. yeah I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, as, as, as you know, full well, the, the, the tough part is the NPI really measures grandiose and that's been, mm. you know, the most that's common a huge that's right. measure, that's why right? we have to create new scales. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then yeah. you probably don't have the data going back in time. So, you know, I can see how that that's, you know, it, it's challenging to, to nail down, you know, the, maybe the, some of the evidence on that, but it, I think that makes perfect sense given the other trends with self-esteem going down, uh, depression going up and so on. And I'm curious, you know, are you using that also to explain some of the things around, like yes. you said, the culture of victimhood? Is that 100%. how you're yes, framing that's it? Really, that's really where all my research is going right now. Yeah. I've kind of put all hands on deck on that topic because I think it's a really urgent issue. Um, and I, th and I'm going to link it to the mental health crisis, but, mm -hmm. um, Yes. So, um, and not to turn the interview around on me, but no, um, I love this it. is a yeah. mutual, mutual inquiry and curiosity. Yeah. What I find really interesting is, um, the, the, the construct of vulnerable narcissism is a mess. And I have argued the best definition of it is just simply, um, entitlement that is based on perceived fragility or past history of suffering. Fascinating. Yeah. And because that way you can directly uh, compare that to grandiose narcissism defined as entitlement um, grounded in uh, perceived superior inherent superiority, mm -hmm. and yep. therefore you can see the contrast. Whereas a lot, some people have a lot of other, they're like neuroticism is the distinguisher between. But yeah. the problem is you start bringing all these other things. You're not, you know, neuroticism doesn't get the entitlement part. You know, no. so so I feel the entitlement is what's core to narcissism, mm -hmm. and we're and there's a lot of like mm -hmm. tangential uh, aspects or facets that are discussed. So yeah. So when you look at it that way, yes, absolutely. I see, um, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've cheekily thought maybe I should just call this generation the fragility generation <laughs> or the fragile, the fragile generation. Um, but there is a sort of, in, sort of entitlement based on, you know, um, on, on, uh, on a fragility, a perceived fragility that one has yeah. that they can't it's, handle the world. Yeah, yeah, and it's I, I've, I've struggled with this a lot too because yeah. you know people have used the label snowflakes. Right. Um, and talked right. about fragility. And I struggle with it so much because although, you know, there's a grain of truth to that, mm. on the other hand, we're talking about a generation where their rates of depression doubled within an eight year period. Yeah. You know, these are really serious mental health issues, and I don't want them dismissed. And I agree. you know what I mean? And I don't, I do. I'm, I'm I do. kind of uncomfortable with the idea of you know anything that's that's trying to to blame or to criticize based on true mental health issues if that makes any sense it well it makes a profound sense and i well i, I personally like to stay away from the you know coddling uh language you know yeah yeah it doesn't feel as compassionate as it could be i i mm -hmm. i raised that in a in a in a discussion i had with uh greg and john mm -hmm. at the at the uh 
comedy cellar <laughs> in New York City. But, of all um, places. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, but but striking that that balance, I find really difficult between saying things that you're feeding into a delusion. Like I think sometimes the highest form of, ki- a form of kindness is not feeding into someone's delusion. Yeah, true. And so I, how do we hold that up, you know, as a mm-hmm. truth while also holding up the fact that it must really suck, like show, like yes. show a little compaction and perspective right. taking it, exactly. they're, what they're feeling, what they're feeling is painful. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know? Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you hold both up at the same time and hold space for both? Right. Yeah. Right. That, that's exactly the challenge. Because, yeah, I mean, you think about Gen Z and their childhood and adolescence and what they've mm-hmm. had to face, you know, not spending as much time with their friends face to face, it being almost mandatory to be on social media and to have all of those pressures. You know, that was that's the only world that they've known. And then it's not a wonder, you know, that so many of them are depressed. But then, you know, does that mean we should just accept? The idea that free speech is dead, I hope not. Yeah, I hope not as well. I I guess when I look at the full pattern of data among Gen Z, I try to understand how which ones are linked to which. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, for instance, this statistic is fascinating. Um, nearly a third of men ages 18 to 25 did not have sex in the last year. Now, I knew that Gen Zers were having less sex, but I actually, until I read your book, did not realize that um, the, the effect was larger for men. Mm-hmm. Um, within that age range, I did not know that, mm-hmm. but I do. I did know that there's a call it a loneliness epidemic. I, I, I guess I'm wary of using the word epidemic, but among young men, there really is um, really sky sky high um, levels of loneliness. And so, I guess I don't know how all these things are linked. If all the women are becoming men, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, take the imagination of how these things could be linked. You know, if now all the young girls now are becoming transgender or or non-binary, you know, like no one wants the men, no one wants the biological men anymore. (laughs) I don't, I don't think that's what's going on though. Okay. Then tell me what's going on. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's always, uh, it's always uh, a little, a little speculative when you're trying to get to the, the, the causes, but for the changes in sexual activity, I, I think some of it is more depressed. So in depression, when people are depressed, why do you think think, men are more depressed? What? Why are they more depressed? Yeah. Um, why do you think? I, I mean, I think it's for a lot of the same reasons that young women are depressed is because the way that they socialize is changed in a way that's not good for mental health. Mm. So I think that that's at the core of a lot of it. Um, so that that piece is in there. Um, some of it is they're just taking longer to grow up. So that, mm. you know, as you know, is another big theme in generations about the slow life strategy, which has its advantages and disadvantages. Mm. But there are just more young men and women who at 20 or 21, when in previous generations, they would have been sexually active, are putting that off until Mm. later in their lives. And that might not be entirely a bad thing. uh, I didn't find the statistic on young women ages 18 to 25. Are they having more sex than prior generations? Or, no, what, it's also less. It's just oh, not as big. Of a I see. Okay, yeah. I I was looking for that statistic. Okay, got it. But there's so there's a lot more um, gender fluidity. Do you think that? It, I mean, I mean, it's so controversial when 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 people propose the sort of social contagion hypothesis. Transgender activists uh, immediately tear, tear that down and and say that's transphobia. So I don't. I'm asking what what the data suggests. Do you think it's it's because is there some is there some cultural influences there or uh, and or could it be that prior generations they would there would have been others rates if it was as acceptable to be transgender in prior generations? Yeah, um, I mean that's what makes it so fascinating. We don't really know. Mm. So I, I I think it's it's definitely true that if you look at say the rise in individualism, more focus on the self, less on social roles, that more acceptance of people being transgender, non-binary is a very logical outcome of, mm. of that you know, cultural system. And I think that's just been growing over time. But that, that is the question of how much of it is due to greater acceptance. And that's the theory that most people go on. But, you know, you dig into it and it, you have to answer a couple of questions that I'm just not sure of the answers yet. Like if it's 
just greater acceptance, if that's really the primary driver, then why is it that identifying as transgender hasn't changed hardly at all among people who are age 30 and older? Because mm-hmm. it hasn't. It's, it's all really only been young adults where you see that huge increase, the quadrupling of those you know, identifying as, as trans. It hasn't really happened with older people. But is it, it's certainly possible that maybe among older people, um, it's just their lives are more settled and it would be a much bigger disruption for them to come out as trans. Bring that down as a, as a way to table that for my own brain, because uh, I want to reflect on that. That is such a good point. Yeah, I, I guess we just don't know. We, we, do, we do know that there is a, you know, we know culturally there's a shift in, 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 uh, among peers and it depends how you want to frame it. You know, you can frame it as acceptance, frame it as like, I don't know if there's peer pressure, you know, ever to sort of feel like, you know, let's say you're, a, you, you, you know, having identity crisis is nothing new to, to, uh, to teenagers uh, in any generation, I'm sure. I'm sure that I'm sure a lot of silence, uh, silent teenagers uh, had uh, identity crisis, crises. Um, and, you know, wanting to belong, wanting to fit in, wanting to be part of you know, a group or, uh, you know, get special privileges, you know, I don't know exactly. Cause I'm obviously not immersed in or immersed in, 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 in school culture right now, you know? So I guess you just have to really look at that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've heard that argument and I understand the idea of like, Oh, maybe people want to fit in and find a group and so on. On the other hand, think about what trans kids and teens have to put up with and the amount of bullying they have to put up with. Yeah, it's just like why right? would they and then, choose then that? Then you think yeah. about it that way. It's like I don't know that it doesn't just doesn't sound as likely. I um I hear you about transgender, but I I'm talking about an overall uh, global pattern of mm-hmm. gender fluidity. Um, sure. in terms of like you know saying like you're non-binary for non-binary seems to be a a really profoundly new category um, than the prior generations. You know, you know I I, I don't know. I could see someone who's having a real serious identity crisis. Um, sort of feeling such pressure to like cling to an identity male or female that they don't feel a resonance with. Mm-hmm. I can see how the non-binary gender is can be very relaxing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see yeah. it. I can see yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's just been made possible by the the all of the shifts you mm-hmm. know that have happened culturally um, around equality and gender and freedom and individualism. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, so much data here. <laughs> um, well, okay, why don't you tell me some of the most surprising facts um, in terms of some myths of generational differences that you came across? You're like, wow, that myth really needs to be debunked. Can you debunk some myths for me, please? I'll try. Um, so, you know, I think there's one is there's this really common perception that boomers are all really economically successful and that income inequality was something that they really um, started and that, you know, boomers became successful and then climbed up the ladder and pulled it up after they had climbed it. So the millennials, you know, couldn't be successful. And it turns out that whole narrative just falls apart, you know, very, very quickly when you start Mm. looking at, at the data. So first, sure, a lot of boomers have done well for themselves, but there's a big segment, especially those who did not go to college where the economy changed underneath them and they found themselves in a pretty difficult situation. Uh, and that's why you get things like a lot more depression, especially among those who are lower income and have um, less education among boomers. And then the findings of Case and Deaton, the famous findings of the mortality rate among middle-aged Americans starting to go up, especially those who are white and um, not college educated. And that's driven by boomers. So you can see the despair in certain segments of of that generation uh, because they are not the kings of the world that they're, you know, are sometimes perceived to be as boomers. They're very much on the other side of that and, you know, with these challenges. And then on the flip side of that is the idea about millennials struggling, that very, very common narrative everywhere online about millennials that they not do as well as their parents. Um, They have to have side gigs. They'll never own houses. Well, median incomes among 26 to 39-year-olds are at all-time highs, corrected for inflation. 
home ownership rates virtually identical for mm. millennials, Gen Xers, and boomers. It's not all completely rosy. Uh, a lot of those income gains have been driven by women, which sounds like a good thing. But then that means, say, a heterosexual couple wants to have kids, then they have to pay for daycare. So there's definitely challenges in there. But that core idea that millennials are not economically successful is exactly wrong. Okay, well, that's that's good to dispel. The idea of uh, this New York Times headline I saw, 37-year-olds are afraid of the 23-year-olds who work for them. Yeah, good headline. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about that many years different, you know, uh, in the whole scheme of the universe. And yet yeah. there seems to be such a gulf, you know, yep. uh, so that's, them. that's, that's millennials who are now the adults in the room now and the they're adult, still the trying to get used to that. Just like yeah. Gen Xers had to get used to it and still kind of aren't. They're trying and to then figure out, Gen Z. Yeah. They're trying to yeah. figure out Gen Z. I see this in the university setting, um, with a uh, millennial and older <laughs> trying mm-hmm. to understand the Gen Zers trying to understand what are the kids. Now there are some people uh, who uh, really think probably Jonathan Haidt and uh, Greg Luganoff would probably think that um, they're giving in too much. It's sort of, there's sort of like a one model of thinking about this as almost like a, a fight or a competition, you know, of like, you know, you know, do we give in to the Gen Z demands, you know, the crazy demands. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's, there mu- there's certainly another view uh, of a lot of professors who are like, wow, there's so much wisdom here in the Gen Zers. And, and I, I've seen the whole gamut as a professor, you know, d- across in, on my faculty meetings. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the faculty meetings, they're, they're divided. But I, I'm just laying out different perspectives and, and, and conceptualizations. Um, a, lot of, uh, you know, a lot of my friends at Barnard College at Columbia, you know, really see a lot of, are like, yeah, you go Gen Zers. They're really um, shaking things up in a way that needs to be shaken up. They're not like, oh, we're coddling them, you know? So, I see I see different different perspectives um, on the table. And so, <laughs> it's almost as if like, you know, even taking the Gen Zers out of the equation, like the other, uh, the other uh, generations don't really agree. Uh, not everyone agrees with each other on how they should treat the Gen Zers or how they should view them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, the last five or six years have given a lot of talks on generational differences. And mm. of course, being a faculty member, one of the most common audiences is my fellow faculty members on various campuses. Yeah. And this is the essential tension. I think it's been true for the decades. The essential tension. I right? feel it. I feel it you on know, campus. It is because yes. you have to figure out how much are you going to change your teaching and how you're presenting things for this generation. Yeah. But then if you completely change it, you, I mean, to be a little extreme about it. And if you give the students exactly what they want, it'd be maybe in some cases anyway, an A for no work. Maybe yeah. we don't want to do that. You know, we yeah. have to figure out what's good for them in the long term. So that doesn't mean we should be sticks in the mud and not change at all. So mm-hmm. there's that that balance, like how much are we going to change in our teaching? And then how much are we not going to change? Because we still have to prepare students for the workplace and grad school. And that we can't, you know, give in too much. But, you know, that is, that is what was one of my goals, certainly, in writing this book, is to start with that piece of understanding of, yes, we have things in common, but here are some of the differences, and then maybe helps you know a little bit more what your students experienced before they reached your classroom. Oh, I love your, I love your um, compassion, and, um, and I, like, I really like the way you think. I do. I realize that when I say things like, uh, I think that this is the generation of vulnerable narcissism, even though I think it's true, I realize that obviously calling uh, people narcissists is not a, a flattering, uh, really, you know, kind way of, of treating a human. But if we can more finely differentiate what really counts technically as entitlement, because I think that we do see some real vulnerable narcissism and what isn't entitlement, but what isn't really entitlement, but are adults kind of saying, oh, that's entitled kids, you know, but actually the, the kids have a good point. Yeah. Sorting out those, that's the nuance that I like, you know, and I feel like I get the sense you do too, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, no, completely. Yeah. I mean, I think that that plays out in the classroom. It plays out in the workplace. I think it's, it's, we're really, it's really something to watch in the political arena as mm-hmm. well. Um, because where, you know, where's, where's the line where's between, the line? You know, oh, these kids are so entitled, or I disagree with them because they're across the political spectrum for me. 
Right. Mm-hmm. So like if you're a Republican and you see young people saying we need universal health care, oh, that's an entitlement. How entitled is that? Right. But then a Democrat might think, no, this is good. They're fighting for the change that they want and, and they believe in this. So, you know, it's it's it is really classic social psychology, isn't it? But how you view it depends on your own attitude. Absolutely. Um, I personally, as a professor, teaching as a professor across generations, have noticed a shift in this sense. I noticed that a lot of students uh, expect now, in a way they never did before, that if they say that a certain material is too hard or it's like difficult, making them uncomfortable having to do the homework, therefore I should be like, oh, no problem, here's your extension. Right. And to me, there is a little bit of entitlement there, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, and I try so hard to be compassionate, but I mean, especially when I was like, oh my god, my parents passed away, but you know, give me an excuse. But what I'm seeing now sometimes are no excuses other than like uh, I had an assignment once where I'm like, just think of one question a week uh, on the readings that you did, and I literally would have some students be like, Professor Kaufman, that's unreasonable request. I can't think of any questions to ask, and I'm like, you're at an Ivy League school, and you can't come up with one question. I'm sorry, but like, right. no, no, yeah. that's not okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean that that's that's the, the one of the. It's just such a huge challenge, you know, mm. being a faculty member that you you want to be fair to all your students, yeah. but then there are sometimes these extenuating circumstances and. And where do you draw that? Where do you draw that line? And then, you know, COVID was a whole other, you know, whole wrench in that works. because that then, you know, we just had to be more flexible just the way it was. And so now we're like, well, now do we have to roll that back? And right. I don't know. I, my, my, my basic philosophy is as much compassion as possible in the classroom to have, to be able to have an open discussion. Yeah. But then, you know, when it comes to actually getting that work done, mm. you, you have to be a little bit more of a hard ass, honestly. Yeah. I mean, if you're at your university, like certain ex- base expectations, <laughs> base at most base level. Is it true that we, this is the most number of living generations alive at the same time than ever in human history? Yeah. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because technology has changed so much, um, mm. the, the generations have gotten shorter. Now, mm. you know, as we discussed, so it's somewhat arbitrary, but. I, I think you can certainly make a case for the cultural change of the last 20 to 30 years being pretty considerable. And so that's why we have the shorter generations. And that's why we have six living American generations right now. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. And I also didn't know that Biden is the first ever silent generation yeah. president. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, ta- I mean, how's he in touch with anyone? <laughs> anyone? <laughs> I guess some would argue he's not, you know, in some political sides, but that's, that's incredible. Hmm. And I mean, in, in general, our political leaders are older now than they were a generation. They're getting older ago. and older. Yes. <laughs> not, not only, no, they're right. getting like every, every yeah. new presence now, like our next president can be 105 years old. <laughs> right. Well, this, this is a debate, right? You know, is that good? Because with age comes wisdom or is it that they're out of touch? And, you know, that's going to vary depending on the individual and so on. But, you know, as a Gen Xer, I, I can tell you there was, you know, when I made the graph showing that that boomers really were blocking the way of, of Gen X into political leadership. Yep. There's there that's when it was a little hard for me to keep my opinion out of it. <laughs> I tried <laughs> as much as I possibly can to keep my opinion out of it, but with that I was like, Yep, I knew it. Oh, I'm sorry, you knew what exactly? Sorry, oh, what just was. that that there was definitely some boomer um, blockage of Gen Xers and partially just because they're a bigger generation, but that doesn't explain all of it. Even if you take that into account um, in both politics and in business, boomers are hanging on to their leadership positions longer than previous generations. And then Mm. Gen X isn't able to move up. Well, there's some speculation Gen X may not want to move up because they're just not into that as much. So interesting. Politically, why does it, feel like the the right like conservatives like they get triggered by gen zers because <laughs> they're because cons- do you see how i turned that, right? turn that around do you see how i turned that around you see how i flip flip the trigger thing <laughs> mm-hmm. but it feels like they get really triggered by gen zers yeah i mean that's yeah. that is there's one way you could use that verb mm-hmm. um well conservatism by definition means you want things to stay the same mm-hmm. it's opposed oh, okay. to progressivism where you want things to change and generally, you know, there there are generational differences, you know, based on when you're born that push people, you know, more toward 
Democrat or liberal and, and Republican or conservative. But there is the general principle that people become more conservative as they get older, partially because it's like, OK, that's enough change. You know, mm. we can stop now. I stop the world. I want to get off. And then young people say, no, you know, we want more change. And so that's, that's, I think, why there's that generational tension, particularly with older conservatives. Older progressives are often like, no, I love the kids. Yes. No, that, well, that's right. And so you see that split on the faculty as well. Yeah. Um, well, this is, so my question is then, Generation X had the consistently most Republican generation. So were the boomers, like, triggered by Generation X, I guess is my question, in a parallel argument? <laughs> Boomers have such an odd uh, political trajectory. They started as You're very, right. very liberal and yeah. then switched to be conservative and seemingly almost overnight, although it was mm. you know, a, a linear change that, that, that took a few decades to, to really um, roll out. But it's almost like with Reagan in the 80s, something clicked and mm. their general tendency switched away from being progressive to being more conservative. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, and then the silent generation, um, the leaders of the civil rights movement, feminist movement, early gay rights movement were actually silenced, not the boomers. That's right. So why don't the silents get the credit that they deserve yeah. for making progress, social progress? Yeah, um, I think they just they just didn't make as much noise as the boomers, mm. partially because of their generational size and partially just because of their kind of generational personality. They're such a fascinating gen generation because... Many of them married young, had their kids young. You know, they were the young people of the 50s and early 60s, where that was kind of the old post-war set of values and, and ways, you know, of living your life. Yet, at the edges, they were the activists. They were the ones who got the laws changed. So, yeah. Martin Luther King Jr., Ruth Bader Ginsburg, both silence, you know, yeah. and most of the leaders of the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, and the gay rights movement as well. Those were, were mostly silence. So the way I ended up parsing it in the book is that the silence, for the most part, changed the laws. Hmm. And then the boomers changed hearts and minds because they actually lived the changes that the silence started in terms of race and gender and sexual orientation. That, I like that. I like that. Um, we have not uh, really talked at all uh, about the greatest generation or the alpha generation. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two that uh, I want to add to uh, maybe your next book. <laughs> we'll we'll yeah. some, somehow add those two. Um, let's first start with the, the greatest generation, um, which is the one uh, before the silent generation, uh, mm -hmm. often because of uh, the greatest, because it's thought they've suffered the most, or they've kind of been through the most epic, uh, most uh, downtrodden events. But could one make the case that with COVID and with that, that maybe Gen Z is the new great generation? Well, I mean, that kind of goes back to the idea that generations come in cycles, which I don't think is true based on the, mm. the data that we have. Um, and I think pandemics are different from wars. Mm. Wars tend to bring people together to fight against a common enemy. And the pandemic drove us apart, if mm. anything. I mean, it could have been that model of a, we're going to band together, but that's not how it turned out. And that is kind of the nature of pandemics, too. Everybody is the enemy you know, because it's contagious, for one thing. And then the stakes are so high in terms of the political decisions that not everybody's going to be happy. So that's how that's how it ended up. And so I think those are two pretty different events. Plus, you know, my main thesis in the book is that those events are not going to have as big of an impact as the changes in technology. Yeah, yeah. The changes in technology are obviously going to even, you know, going on in uh, the next hundred years. It'll be so interesting to see what, what happens there. So then let's talk about, yeah, the alpha generation and beyond. How do you see the rise of AI? as maybe affecting generational differences, especially when we get to, I, I don't think we're that far away from cyborg territory. You know, are we going to have the cyborg generation someday, mm -hmm. do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And I, I think, you know, that that's the uh, stuff with, you know, chat GPT and so on that didn't even enter the scene until I turned in the book. So I hadn't had the chance to really consider, you know, how that, that might change the, you know, this, this next uh, very young generation is still mostly in elementary school 
Um, mm-hmm. And some haven't even been born yet. So that's born 2013 and later. So I, I actually call them polars after political polarization and the melting polar ice caps. Mm-hmm. Um, alphas is based on the idea that, you know, we're going to do all the letters and then we had Gen Z and then we ran out of letters. So let's go back to the beginning of the alphabet and start to use the Greek alphabet. I'm not a big yeah. fan of the letters overall. So I'm hoping eventually we'll move away from them. Is that where we're, did someone propose alpha? I mean, is that, is that what's on the list for the next one? Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of marketers when they, when they talk about them, that's the label that they use. Um, so yeah, a couple times in a row now I've, I've tried to say, let's get away from the letters and I haven't been successful, but I'm going to keep trying. There is something really, um, profound, um, about the fact that all, this is the, you know, the, the, the longest, all five generations have all lived together and we all faced a really significant catastrophe together. Mm-hmm. So like ending this interview, can we be a little bit more like uniting <laughs> than, than devi- divisive? Isn't there a great bonding experience that, you know, even that we can all have with each other? I mean, we all went through this. It's not like just the Gens. The Gen Zers sometimes act as though they, they're the only ones who went through crap. No, I'm just, sorry. <laughs> but we all went through this together, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, what What can we do to kind of like all really just show compassion for each other no matter the age i hope we can do that i think it's it's very it's very tough though because the the pandemic did really exacerbate the political polarization and the generational conflicts you know that were already there Hmm. but what i would really really like to see is just trying to turn more toward more positivity Hmm. um if possible yeah. I'm not talking about Pollyanna stuff or, you know, not recognizing that we have problems to solve, but the really pervasive negativity across all generations, maybe in particular Gen Z, but pretty much everybody these days thinking, you know, we're on the, right, the wrong track and we can't solve these problems. And this is the worst time ever. Can we have some recognition? That this is actually a really great time to be alive. That yeah, we have challenges, but Consider what it would have been like to live 200 years ago or 100 years ago without the conveniences that we have and try to appreciate technology that's made our lives better while trying to rein in some of the technology that has maybe not made our lives better. And of course, the thing I talk about the most with that is just putting more regulation around social media, especially with kids. And maybe that would help. It'll help. Maybe that'll help with mental health. Maybe that'll help with our politics. Yes. You, now you talk about you're focusing on technology, but I think from a St- Stephen Pink, a Stephen Pinker Enlightenment Now perspective, he's documented in all the many ways that society has shown progress yes. over the years. You know, Absolutely. many, many Excellent multitude point. of multitude of ways, right? uh, in, including um, uh, gender rights. You know, and yeah. um, and uh, racial. You know. Uh, uh, right. and, the, in, and the overall decline in aggression yeah. and violence. Yeah, yeah. You made that yeah. case in the in, in the other book, and I mean that's it's 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 all it's all true. We I think it's just so easy to take for granted the good things. Mm. I, mean, I think that's human nature in a lot of ways, right? Mm. But I I get a little concerned when I see people saying, "Oh, 2023, that's the worst time." Really? Mm. <laughs> is that really worse than the beginning of the pandemic? Is it worse than the Great Recession? Mm. Is it worse than the 80s when we thought Russia was going to drop the bomb at any moment? Mm. I don't think it is. Mm. Well, that's great. I just want to end on that note. I wanted to end on some sort of, you know, uniting note there. And uh, um, thank you for your incredible legendary work in our field of psychology. Uh, this is the psychology podcast. So I have to thank you for your legendary work in the field. I'm glad I finally got a chance to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you for what you do as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.